Imagine you're sitting on a 1,000cc MotoGP bike. The lights are red. Your heart is pounding. In front of you, 22 other machines capable of hitting 300 kilometers per hour in seconds. You twist the throttle, dump the clutch, and somehow the bike doesn't loop backward. It rockets forward, clean and stable. How? This isn't just rider skill, it's electronics, launch control, traction control, anti-wheelie. The invisible hand that lets riders push physics to its breaking point and win. But how do these systems actually work? And how much control do they take away from the rider? Let's pull back the curtain on the most advanced electronic systems in motorsports. Rewind to the early 2000s. MotoGP was entering a new age. Bikes were getting faster, lean angles sharper, and riders were pushing the limits of what rubber and reflexes could handle. At that point, electronics were barely a whisper, mostly used for data logging, lap times, throttle input, engine RPMs, all stored for post-session analysis. It was useful, but passive. Engineers were watching what had already happened, but that changed quickly. When the series moved from the wild 990cc four-strokes to the more rev-happy 800cc machines in 2007, something became obvious. These bikes were way harder to tame. Less torque meant riders had to rev the engines higher, keeping them in the sweet spot of the power band. But that made throttle control trickier, especially at full lean. More mistakes started creeping in. Riders were asking for more help. Enter the era of active electronics. MotoGP engineers started linking the ECU to more sensors, not just for data collection, but for live decision making. Wheel speed sensors, throttle position, lean angle gyros, GPS tracking. Now, instead of simply recording data, the bike could react to it in real time. Suddenly, the ECU wasn't just a brain, it was a co pilot. And with that shift, the whole philosophy of riding changed. Riders no longer had to ride conservatively to stay safe. They could push harder, trusting that electronics would step in when things got sketchy. Wheel spin? The ECU catches it. Sudden lift of the front wheel? Anti-wheelie takes over? Massive torque spike mid-corner? Traction control is already on it. It was a turning point. MotoGP has officially entered the digital arms race. From that moment on, electronic rider aids weren't just optional, they were essential. And in many ways, they've been quietly rewriting what it means to ride at the edge of control ever since. The race lights go out, and in that split second, a MotoGP rider has to do the impossible. Launch a 300 horsepower bike off the line without flipping it, spinning the rear tire, or bogging down. And they have to do it while jostling elbow to elbow with 20 other lunatics aiming for the same apex. Welcome to the world of launch control. Before launch control, race starts were chaos. Riders would burn out clutches, spin tires into smoke or worse, loop the bike into a terrifying backflip. Getting a clean launch required perfect throttle finesse, clutch control, and split-second timing. One mistake and you'd get swallowed by the grid. But now, riders have a secret weapon. When they line up on the grid, they flip a switch, usually on the left bar. That tells the ECU, get ready to launch. From that moment, the system steps in and starts prepping the bike. First, it limits the RPMs. The rider can hold the throttle wide open, but the engine won't go past a preset ceiling, typically around 10,000 RPM. That keeps the power in the sweet spot without spinning the tire into oblivion. Next, the system manages torque delivery. As the clutch is released, the ECU smooths out power to the rear wheel, minimizing sudden surges that could break traction. And finally, many bikes use a mechanical hole shot device that compresses the front forks, lowering the bike's center of gravity. That keeps the front end from popping up during acceleration, like pulling the nose of a fighter jet back down to the runway. But here's the twist. None of this makes it easy. 
launch control doesn't do the job for the rider. It just gives them a fighting chance. They still have to nail the clutch release, read the lights, hold their line, and react to what's happening around them. It's not autopilot. It's more like an invisible teammate, helping the rider survive the most explosive few seconds in motorsport. Now picture this. You're leaned over at 60 degrees, knee scraping the asphalt, the throttle cracked wide open, and the rear tire is trying to launch 300 horses into the ground. There's barely a contact patch the size of a credit card holding you up. One twitch too far, and you're high-sided into orbit. This is where traction control becomes a literal lifesaver. MotoGP bikes don't rely on luck to stay upright in corners. They rely on real-time decisions made thousands of times per second by the bike's brain, the ECU. This brain is constantly reading data from a network of sensors spread all over the machine. The most critical ones? Wheel speed sensors. These sensors are watching the front and rear wheel like a hawk. If the rear wheel starts spinning faster than it should, especially when leaned over, the ECU senses that it's slipping. But here's the magic. It doesn't just slam the brakes or cut power like a panic reflex. It reacts with surgical precision. The ECU can retard the ignition timing, making the engine fire later, and generate less torque. It can cut spark to specific cylinders, softening the power pulse so it doesn't overwhelm the rear tire. It can slightly close the ride-by-wire throttle, even if the rider's wrist is fully open. It can even tweak the fuel-air mixture on the fly. And the best part? The rider often doesn't even feel it. Maybe just a subtle wiggle or a tiny hesitation in power. But no drama, no crash, and definitely no broken collarbone. Riders also work with their crew to fine-tune this control. They create multiple traction maps based on the track layout, weather, tire wear, and even their own riding style. Some corners demand a gentle hand, others, pure aggression. The electronics adapt accordingly. It's not just about keeping the bike upright, it's about pushing right to the edge of disaster, then pulling back without ever losing speed. You're coming out of a slow corner. The rear tire digs into the tarmac, the throttle is wide open, and the engine roars like it's trying to rip the chassis apart. Suddenly, the front end floats off the ground, cool for a street stunt, deadly in a MotoGP race. Welcome to the problem of wheelies. With the kind of power MotoGP bikes produce, especially with today's insane torquey curves and seamless gearboxes, the front wheel wants to lift almost constantly. On every hard acceleration, physics is screaming to throw that bike skyward. But when your job is to go forward, not upward, wheelies become a time-killing nuisance. That's where anti-wheelie control comes into play. This isn't some blunt instrument that simply kills power the moment the front lifts. It's a finely tuned balancing act. The system is constantly measuring vertical acceleration, throttle position, rear torque output, and the difference in speed between the front and rear wheels. The moment it senses the front getting too light before your eyes or body even register it, it steps in. The ECU may soften throttle response by slightly closing the electronic throttle valves. It can reduce torque by adjusting ignition timing or managing fuel delivery. In some setups, it may even slightly engage rear brake pressure to bring the nose back down gently, like pulling the reins on a racehorse before it bolts. But here's the art in it. Riders don't want zero wheelie. In fact, a tiny bit of lift is often faster. The trick is to float the front wheel just above the track, high enough to avoid weight transfer issues, but low enough to maintain control and steering stability. That's why anti-wheelie systems are highly customizable. Riders set the sensitivity themselves, often lap by lap. Some prefer the front to stay glued. Others like the freedom to dance just off the tarmac. Too much control slows you down, too little, and you're flipping a 160 kilogram missile backward. Anti-wheelie isn't about safety, it's about speed. 
pure, uninterrupted acceleration, precisely managed by a digital hand that knows just when to pull back and when to let go. In MotoGP, it's not just the riders who compete. It's the engineers, the coders, the data analysts, the invisible army behind every lap. For years, factory teams like Honda, Yamaha, and Ducati had a massive edge in this area. Their custom-built ECUs were so advanced, so secretive, they were practically magic boxes of code and wizardry. Independent teams? They just couldn't keep up. Not because they lacked talent, but because they lacked the budget to play the electronics arms race. That all changed in 2016. MotoGP made a bold move. From that season forward, every single team, whether factory-backed or satellite, was required to use the same standardized electronic control unit, the Magneti Morelli ECU. Not only that, but the base software was unified too. Everyone had to start with the same set of tools. The idea was simple, level the playing field. Now, instead of one team spending millions to shave milliseconds with custom code, everyone had access to the same engine management, traction control, anti-wheelie, and launch control systems. It didn't eliminate performance gaps overnight, but it definitely narrowed them. Of course, teams didn't suddenly stop being clever. They just had to redirect their brilliance. The unified ECU still allows for custom tuning, different maps, and rider-specific strategies. The core software is the same, but the way each team uses it, that's where creativity shines. Think of it like this. Every chef now gets the same kitchen, same oven, same knives, same stove, but the recipes, those are still wide open. The unified ECU didn't kill innovation. It just made it more transparent and way more competitive. And for fans, it meant tighter racing, more surprise podiums, and smaller gaps between giants and underdogs. It didn't take the soul out of MotoGP. It gave more riders a shot at greatness. Imagine a circuit like Assen, flowing high-speed bends, tight technical sections, and a few lung-emptying straights. It's a rider's dream and a bike's nightmare. Why? Because one traction control setting simply won't work for the entire lap. That's where GPS-based corner mapping comes in. Modern MotoGP bikes are equipped with ultra-precise GPS systems, often accurate to within a meter. The ECU always knows exactly where the bike is on track, and it uses that information to dynamically adjust the bike's behavior, turn by turn. Heading into a tight corner like turn one, the bike might switch to a map that increases engine braking and dials up the traction control. Preparing for a long, sweeping section like Turn 5, the ECU softens throttle delivery, giving the rear tire room to breathe without losing grip. The beauty is that the rider doesn't have to lift a finger. These map transitions happen automatically, programmed ahead of time with the rider's input and real-world data. It's as if a race engineer is riding a pillion, adjusting settings in real time with every flick of the wrist. This kind of precision doesn't just make the bike faster, it lets the rider attack every inch of the circuit with full confidence. Here's where it gets interesting. Despite all this technology, the rider is still the most important variable. Every system, launch control, TC, anti-wheelie, is programmable. And who decides how it's programmed? The rider and their crew chief. Riders spend hours going through data, testing maps, reviewing throttle traces. They'll do laps with different settings and give feedback. Too much intervention in turn three, or let the wheel spin a bit more on exit. And when it's race day, the rider has handlebar switches to toggle engine maps, adjust traction levels, and even disable anti-wheelie mid-race. It's not automation, it's augmentation. Of course, there's a flip side. Critics argue that electronics make racing sterile, that it's less about bravery and more about bites, that a great rider today needs a great programmer more than raw guts. Is that true? Not quite. Yes, electronics help manage the madness, but they don't replace instinct. 
ask any MotoGP rider, and they'll tell you, no amount of traction control can save you from a bad line, a botched corner entry, or late braking into a wet apex. In fact, many crashes happen despite electronics. They're not foolproof. What they do is let riders push closer to the limit over and over again, safely, repeatedly. That's not reducing skill, that's redefining it. MotoGP electronics aren't slowing down. Future developments are already in the works, AI-based predictive mapping, adaptive suspension systems integrated with ECUs, real-time telemetry adjustments via pit wall, and maybe one day traction systems that learn your style as you ride. But even then, the throttle will still be in the rider's right hand. Because no matter how smart the system gets, it still takes a human to win a race. And maybe that's the ultimate secret of MotoGP electronics. Not replacing the rider, but empowering them to be superhuman. So next time you watch a race and you see that perfect launch, that controlled slide, that front wheel hovering off the ground like magic, know this. Behind every move is a dance of algorithms, sensors, and timing. A symphony of electronics working silently, relentlessly, to keep the chaos under control. But at the center of it all, a rider, still risking everything, still riding the edge, still trusting that fine line between brilliance and disaster. And if you found this peek behind the curtain as thrilling as the races themselves, go ahead, hit that subscribe button. We've got more untold stories from the world of MotoGP coming your way. You won't want to miss a single one.